Hi, this is Robert Clinky Beard with the Commercial Landscaper Podcast. We're going to take 20 minutes to deliver some amazing content from accomplished leaders and business owners to provide you with some value to scale your business and to become a better leader and push yourself out of your comfort zone. We encourage you to like and share with everyone to spread our messages. I'm super excited to announce our new partnership with Weathermatic. For most landscape companies, irrigation is an untapped goldmine for growth and profit, but labor and process problems stand in the way. So Weathermatic has created a partnership to package mobile technology and software with proven business solutions to tackle the perennial irrigation challenges and take your operations to a whole new level. I encourage you to reach out to Weathermatic and learn more. Cheers, everyone. Hi, this is Robert Clicky here with the Commercial Landscaper Podcast. I'm really excited to be joined by Chris Hale. Chris, uh, welcome to the show today. Oh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. We talked a couple of weeks ago before you came on the show, and uh, it was interesting, good timing, because I'd just been hacked the week before. But uh, I'd love for my audience just to know a little bit about you and your background. Chris? Oh, yeah. We are a managed services company out of Denver, Colorado. I personally have been in IT for about 25 years uh, at all different levels from, I mean, started back with AS. 400s back in the day, a networking, network admin. I started this company in 2010 and we've kind of grown from there. Right before the pandemic, we got deeply into cybersecurity. That's kind of been our, our wheelhouse for the last three or four years is really uh, cybersecurity, five years probably. We have a decent sized team. Most, I think our, our most senior person has about 20 years experience. And we've got some younger guys that we're just trying to, to bring up through things and kind of dealing with the new reality of just the way small businesses are having to deal with keeping themselves secure, especially going to the cloud. I mean, everybody's kind of cloud-based anymore and opens up to everyone. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, especially over the last few years with with yeah. COVID, there's a lot more virtual working. So tell, tell me a little bit more about, you know, because the more conversations I've had with people within my network, and obviously I've just experienced it myself, there's just a lot more, you know, emails coming along where, you know, they're asking you for a wire transfer or just something's a little bit weird about it. But then you look in the name and the name looks the same. So talk to me, I suppose, about the the different types of hacking out there unless the list is too long i think like where what we're talking about here is you're talking about more of your phishing type situation a little right. bit of probably uh what's called social engineering they kind of know their target a little bit they uh figured out what email addresses they may have hacked one of your one one of your clients one of your vendors they kind of have some sort of idea of, of how to get through to you and those are kind of the low-hanging fruit type hacks uh, your higher level hacks you have coming down with the ransomware and pieces like that where you're getting into a little bit more aggressive type situations but the phishing one is the most prevalent one within small businesses it's the easiest yet yeah. and then you also have the cell phone type phishing situations you have all sorts of those things i mean we can look at the vegas hack where they basically just did social engineering against mgm went out and looked who worked for the company i went through social media figured it out acted like they were that person, called into their help desk and had that help desk person click on a link and next thing you know, you're in. So really the the key part that most people need to worry about is understanding how well they're able to trick people and how well they're able to send out these emails. Like you're saying, what you're talking about where that email, where the name's the same is spoofing. They're spoofing the address. And unless you know what to look for, or if they've actually taken over an email account, which is possible too, it's hard to tell what's going on. Yeah, I mean, there's obviously so many things out there. Talk to me a little bit more about the the Vegas scenario because I think when you mentioned it to me, I, I was obviously hadn't followed that. But talk to me about what the I suppose what that led to. I was just in Las Vegas a couple of weeks ago, and this is quite a few weeks after the attack. Pack was what beginning of October or the beginning of September, and it was the end of September when I was out there. I mean, the check in process was a mess. Their computer systems were still messed up. They'd done enough damage there. There was no Wi-Fi in the hotel I was staying at. Well, there, the Wi-Fi was there, but it didn't pass information because it was damaged. I mean, it just, they did a massive job on these casinos. Caesars had been hit not long before that, and Caesars paid the ransom. So what they had basically done is loaded ransomware on and to some of their core infrastructure, and they hadn't had it. They were still fixing those machines to get them back up. So a lot of their infrastructure was messed up, which caused, I don't know how many millions and millions of dollars of loss and, and productivity time they lost it within that. And that's a, I mean, Vegas, while they seem secure, they probably don't pay as much as they should towards security on that part. They're still a lot better than the average small business. Right. 
So talk to me about the, the ransom part. I mean, assuming Packers come in, they take over your system, and then they hold you to ransom until you pay some type of dollar amount to take all the software off, or explain that a little bit more. The, the funny part about hackers, like a good hacker, what they're going to do is they're going to get access to, say, like your email system, something of that nature. And what they're going to do is they're are to your computer, and they're going to load software, and usually they're going to load software that isn't, generally considered virus-based. Uh, IP scanners, things that your antivirus isn't going to pick up on that are normal tools. And what they're using those to, to do is to, to go out and look around. They're also probably at some point going to put some sort of script out there and they're going to use, a lot of times they're using like on a Windows machine, they're using the native functionality to call out to the internet where your antivirus isn't picking up on weird things going on. There's things like uh, macros within uh, Word and Excel where you can have those, those things can call out like you can, somebody can send you a resume and click on it. What they're doing is they're going to call down their software so it's, it's laying dormant on your machine. And what they're going to do is learn everything they can about you. They're going to learn your bank accounts. They're going to get key login with all your passwords. They're going to learn as much as they can, take as much time. And it's not until the very end to where either they feel like they've been discovered or they just have gotten so much information in the first place that they're actually going to ransomware you. So they're going to do a lot more damage than just the ransomware usually. Now, the other side of it is you have a lot of inexperienced hackers, people that don't know what they're doing that are out there buying tools off the dark web. They're going to come in and hit you right away. They're going to try to do something right off the bat. But the good ones are going to sit and wait and watch. And they're going to do things like within your email system, figure out how you invoice people. And then maybe they'll set up some rules in your email so that those invoices or things from that person don't actually, you don't actually see them. And then they can make a similar email, same signature, everything, and bring it in so that you're seeing something different. It could be an invoice from a vendor, which we'd had a situation a few years back where one of our clients, they weren't hacked, but they're their client was, and they would send an invoice to that person. That person already had been watching. So they had, they had put a rule so that they didn't see the original invoice. They took that invoice, redid the whole thing, used a spoof email address, uh, put in the new routing and account number for the wire transfer, sent it back to them. So they that client sent $10,000 to an invoice. And the invoice looked exactly the same because it was the invoice. It just had a few little things changed on it. And they spent $10,000 and $10,000 gone. I mean, a lot of times... You, People don't have cybersecurity insurance and other things to cover that. So it's very simple for a good hacker to go out there and figure out what's going on. And that wasn't even a, a complicated or a, a, a good hack scheme. It was just basic understanding of how people work and how to change things within email systems and understanding right. the process. And assume there's no, you know, once you pay that money, you're not recovering. I mean, you have no claim against the bank or anything, correct? Yeah, most of them, the bank or anything like that will not get it back for you. And there's a lot of legal places on who's at fault. A lot of people struggle with trying to, the, they get into the blame game of, well, you sent the invoice so that you're hacked at this pieces, but the, the law doesn't really cover that to say that who's exactly at fault. And a lot of those pieces stand out really strangely. It's a pretty rough situation. I mean, what I recommend is make sure you have cybersecurity insurance. That's going to help right off the bat. They're, they're more experienced with dealing with the whole situation. And really, the, the key part to avoid a lot of stuff is education. Educating your employees to look for things. Look for your password, like things asking for your password to look for in these email addresses. Like the email address in the, in the example I was giving, they changed two letters within the email address when they spoofed mm -hmm. it. So they just created a secondary domain. And there's there's tools and like companies like ours have the ability to go out and actually do searches for uh, spoofed domains that are just slightly different that, that people are trying to do against that and, and be able to block those. But we can only block them internally to the, the client themselves. They can still go out to, to vendors and other companies. So right. the, the big piece is most hackers are looking for low-hanging fruit, and it's easy to get into somebody's email. It's easy to get somebody to click on something. I mean, people still go out and buy gift cards to pay people for stuff. I mean, we've had, we've had a client that would call and be like, our employees have just bought two thousand dollars of gift cards to give to somebody, and you're like, "Yeah." So, I mean, it happens. It's <laughs> I've heard of that happening as well. Yeah, yeah. The Nigerian prince from like the early two thousand <laughs> still exists. It's just a little different now. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and when you talk about low hanging fruit, I mean, are you talking about you know more of those smaller, medium sized businesses that they don't necessarily think that having some type of an IT expert or you know some type of protection they just say they don't have the budget for it but an actual fact i'm assuming it can cost a lot a lot of money we mitigated a attack for one of our clients and we mitigated it this is it didn't fully go all the way through we were able to stop it early and just that by itself was a thirty thousand dollar bill so yeah. yeah it's 
it's cheaper to get something on. I mean, bringing somebody on for a few thousand dollars a month to cover some of these things and get some of these tools running properly to protect you is way better than having your data taken and be between 30 to a couple hundred thousand dollars of fix it. If, if they actually get in and do a lot of damage and they, they do hostage your data, it can be between a few hundred thousand to a few to tens of millions, right? I mean, 15 million. And most small businesses don't have that. The low hanging fruit attacks tend to be the lower level hackers that are just looking to get quick money, $1,500 here, a few thousand dollars here. And that's, those are the ones that are going to hit these small businesses, but also you have the ability depending on where you're at and what your industry is, there's a lot of compliance pieces in there and it can cause uh, reputation harm. It can put you in legal jeopardy to be hacked. There's a lot of pieces to it and how to, to walk those roads and the legal parts, parts that exist and what you have to give to your clients. Also, you're, you become a vector for your clients. They get all this information from your clients. You have all your clients' banking information for ACH, things like that. That all becomes wide open. So it, it just, there's a, amount, a huge amount of stuff that can happen to these small businesses that don't realize... They think they're too small, but they're a nest egg of more information. They're also an easier target because they're not protecting a lot of these things. Right. So, you know, you mentioned down there about, you know, getting cyber insurance, which I assume protects them from some of the losses. But what were some of the things that could be done more on the proactive side? I mean, I know I'm probably hearing people in the background saying, oh, you know, we'll get, you know, Norton anti spyware or you know other yeah. off-the-shelf type softwares out there but I'm, I'm assuming that's pretty limited to the protection you can get yeah well like i was saying before that a lot of times they're using things that won't be hit by your antivirus things that they're they're calling out on a, other calling up going around your antivirus they're not using viruses to attack you they're using actual tools that they've loaded on oh, okay and i think education is the number one protection. I mean, you can go out and get like phishing training, look at some of the companies that do it or hire a company that helps you do your phishing training where they, they give you so many tests for your employees. They, they teach you what's going on. Then they send out phishing attacks to your, to your actual company that are, that are fake ones. And they can test who's opening them, who's doing that. So you can better train to the ones that are updating all your systems is a huge piece. Make sure you're running all your updates and not just like your windows updates, but I don't know if everybody remembers the log4j thing that hit a couple of years ago where a lot of your like printers, wireless access points, they have your little your your web enabled logins to be able to set them up and that's all run on a thing called Apache. Well there was a log4j piece in there that allowed hackers to get access to these all these different devices that they could just then use for vectors to get into other pieces of your network and cause harm. It just opened up doors and they could load ransomware through them and things like that. So Keeping things up to date is really important. We have what's called a security stack versus just antivirus. So we have our antiviruses are the, the newer versions of your EDRs, where the more advanced type of antiviruses. But we also have what's called a security operating center that monitors for any type of things going on that can stop things both on the Office 365 or the Google side, the cloud side. There's weird logins from weird places, those kind of things. Another big piece is that we use is antitrust. And there's two types of, we use an application antitrust, which basically says, here's the list of applications allowed to run on this machine. If it's not one of these, then it doesn't run, which is super effective. And then there's a network zero trust where it's like, this individual is only allowed to access these things, period. So that it, it limits the ability to laterally spread if they do get compromised. So those are things that to look at. Smaller businesses though, I would look at, make sure you get insurance, make sure you start training. I mean, education is a huge piece of it. And everybody thinks that it's the lower, the like, let's say it's the admin that does it or whatever. We just had one with a client the other day that had global admin access to their, well, that's, that'll be another piece I'd go over is don't have mail enable global admin accounts on your cloud. Things that can control those cloud environments, take the mail piece off of that and don't have like, I'm the owner of the company. So I've, I've got admin rights to this because you might click on an email and give away your password. Next thing you know, that whole thing's compromised from top to bottom. Right. And so don't give global admin rights to everybody. Don't, I mean, just have one, one to three that are separate of everybody else. Teach people to look for, like I said, we had this client, one of their top dev guys went in, clicked on an email, gave away his password. Luckily he knew, figured it out right away and we were able to get in and stop it. But he had full rights to their entire Office 365 tenant, control everything. One of the things hackers can do is they can ransom your tenant, give away, take away all your rights to it. So you can't get your email, can't go to your SharePoint. 
and make you pay to give that back. You can lobby Microsoft to get it back, but it could take three to six months for them to verify that you own it. So you can completely mm -hmm. take your business down. Yeah, so, I've heard of that happening where, yeah, their system goes down, but yeah, it'll take them a good week to 10 days to get things up and running. For small business, that's crippling to them. Yeah, completely. It can... I mean, you can have your, your company can be shut down with something like this. I mean, they're big pieces, but there's simple things you can put in place. Like I said, training, make sure that you keep everything up to date. Uh, if you have firewalls, make sure there's a thing called deep packet scanning on a lot of them on the newer firewalls. Make sure that's turned on. That's like your last piece of defense. If something does get in and tries to call out to bring down some malicious software, hopefully that's able to stop it. I mean, there's no 100% stopping of everything. But if you do things the right way, you limit, you become, you're no longer the, the low hanging fruit. You're harder to break into. And you're less likely to have a major hack go on. Unless some of the big companies, they're getting hacked because the amount of money they're worth and things like that. So there's really good hackers going after that, trying to figure out again. But your average small business, you're, they're just looking for the easiest route in. Just like anywhere else with crime, they just want to find a low hanging fruit that they can hit and then do damage to. That makes sense. Yeah, you know, people on the call here, the podcast are listening, they're, they're freaking out and they're thinking, oh, maybe, maybe I call Chris, or Chris's company. You know, what, what are some of the initial things that you would do? I mean, would you go in and remotely access some of these the laptop and just start doing some scanning and seeing what's already there? Or what, what would be your initial steps? Initial steps would be to have an interview with them and understand what they're doing already and kind of how things are set up. A secondary steps is we have some tools that will do security audits. We have some that will do cloud audits and some that will do internal audits. They'll go out and create reports for us to look at to see where the holes are at. And then what we would do is put together a project. Our, it depends on how it was. If it was just a simple, like they needed to come in and have security audited we do an audit and give them purely what's going on it, it, it's a real simple report that kind of tells you where your problems are and why or if the, we were bringing them on as a client we'd basically set up these projects and say this is what needs to be done over this period of time because you sometimes you run into stuff where it's like hey this is going to be a, a long process so we would go through and set up projects and, and let them know where they need to set up things the other big piece is policy and procedure get your policies put there Get a procedure so you know if something was to happen, you go to A, you go to B, you go to C, so you're not scrambling. So we help set that up for them too, so that things run a lot more smoothly all the way around. And then it's not just one audit. You want to make sure you're doing quarterly audits. Make sure, because things change, things get missed. Try to take out the human element a little bit and, and find out where those holes might be, where things might not be getting done the way you thought, or you, you go out and you think, this is what, we, we fixed this, so we can just let it go. And all of a sudden, maybe something didn't get done right or something has changed in that environment, you get a chance to audit it. So you really want to just keep up on it. And what we do a lot of times with our clients is set those type of things up and have meetings and go over it and keep it top of mind and make sure that we're checking our own work. We also, not only do when we work with a company, we have a third party cybersecurity company that audits us and we use them to check our work. So they do an audit on top of us doing an audit. They look at our work and say, well, here's some other holes that might be here. So it's just due diligence is the big piece of it. And when somebody calls us, that's what we put in place. Right. And it must be, it was just comes back to your policy procedures where, you know, with the, the virtual working or hybrid environment, you know, people are taking their laptops to work and then maybe taking back to the house and, you know, people in the house are maybe not as, you know, secure as them. And then they may be traveling, going through airports, hotels. I'm assuming logging on to a lot of those public networks are probably a big source of a lot of issues as well, correct? Oh yeah, for sure. But one thing that we always tell our clients is no, bring your own devices. We tell them not to allow employees to work off their own devices because you don't know what their kids might be looking at on that device or maybe loading to it. If you get a good security stack on there, it helps prevent those kind of things. Make sure you're part of a domain and there's security pieces put in there. There's also a lot of really cool uh, VPN mesh technology out there right now that you can use where you actually load. It's a client that goes on the machine and what it does is it keeps that machine behind the firewall no matter where it's at. So it basically keeps you behind. It acts like it's at your office whenever it's on the internet. It could be at a coffee shop, be wherever, but your security is set office back on the front of that. So the, the coffee shop Wi-Fi can't see past that. There's a wall there. It controls it. And then it has a bunch of security features in and of itself to help things. Those are some things that people do with a lot of remote clients type situations, especially like people that travel a lot. You put those kind of things in place. There's a lot of options with that to, to help protect against that. Now, those tend to be with larger situations. I mean, not super huge, but for the small businesses, the key thing is make sure you just keep good security 
software on there. Uh, make sure that you have a login that's protected. MFA is the number one piece on a lot of your cloud stuff. Make sure you're doing multi-factor authentication. I mean, it's not impenetrable, but it makes it harder to get in. You build those kind of things. You have good security software, those kind of things. It helps when they're logging into these different, because I travel all over the place. I'm on hotel Wi-Fi, all those kind of things. And our stuff has to be super secure because we're a vector to our clients. Right. So our security levels have to be super high. So we just keep a really good security stack on everything. Um, we audit our machines. We're, we make sure our updates are up to date. And we don't like get on like free Wi-Fis and things that may have the ability that somebody could. Yeah, that makes sense. Well, this has been uh, super informative. How can people get in touch with you? What would be the next steps if they're interested in some type of security and just the website evaluation? is technologyresponse.com. It's easy to go through that. We have an info at technologyresponse.com. And then we have a local number. We're working on our 800 number. Our local number is 720-420-1582 out of the Denver market. But you can get a hold of us at any time. And if you need a security audit, and most of our clients are not in the Denver area. We have uh, we have some global clients, Australia, South America. We do a lot of that. We're big into compliance. So we're, we're dealing with a lot of the different compliance throughout the, the world. And we have all across the country, we have clients everywhere. So we're able to work with anybody anywhere at any time. So yeah, those are the easiest way to get all this. Or they can email me directly, chris at technologyresponse.com. Awesome, Chris. Thanks for uh, educating us today. Hopefully a few people listen and take the next steps to to secure their system. But I really appreciate your time today, Chris. Yeah, 100%. Thank you for having me on. I really appreciate it. Take care. Thank you, Chris. Hopefully that was pure dead brilliant to you and you got some great takeaways for your business or your leadership role. This is Robert Clinkybeard and I'd love to get you and your friends to join us in a future journey so please subscribe to the various podcast channels or visit the commerciallandscaper.com or wilson360.com. Big thank you again to our partner Weathermatic and I really encourage you to reach out to them and see about irrigation solutions or partnership with them. Hopefully you have a pure, dead, brilliant day. Cheers, everyone.